I'm Mark Dawson from The Self-Publishing Show, and this is Self-Publishing Spotlight, where we shine a light on the indie authors who are changing the world of publishing one book at a time. Hello, and welcome to The Self-Publishing Spotlight. We meet indie authors at all stages of their careers and ask them a series of five questions. Five questions about their process, their mistakes, and their successes. Five answers that will help you level up your own author career. My name's Tom Ashford, and I'm part of The Self-Publishing Formula. Don't forget that you can get your self-publishing resource kit at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash starter kit. This week's guest is David Penny. He's written 11 books in the historical mystery genre. He lives in North Gloucestershire, but sometimes Spain. Welcome, David. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, Tom. It's great to have you. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your books and sort of the, uh, the about the historical mystery genre and stuff like that first? Yeah, sure. Um I currently write, I used to write science fiction when I was very young and, and I had a trad deal. Um, these days I write historical mysteries. Um, they're, they're set in a very popular period, which is Tudor. Unfortunately, I decided to set them in Spain instead of England. Um, so my books uh, are about an English emigre who trains to become a surgeon works for a sultan in Granada and solves crimes and has a buddy who is a six-foot eunuch. And between the two of them, they, they try to cure the world, which is very difficult at the time period. Well, yeah, that sounds absolutely great. Um, okay, well, question number one is, uh, why do you write? I don't have any option but to write. I've, I've, <laughs> it's like a, it's something I have to do. I've always done it. I've always read extensively and... I think I can remember when I was 11 years old, sitting in our garden with my grandfather's portable typewriter, writing a story about alien invasion. Um, it's a shame I lost it because it would make me laugh, at least if nothing else now. Yeah. Um, and and it's, I've always done it. Um, I wrote and wrote and wrote and got rejected and rejected. And then at the age of 24, uh, I had a book deal with Robert Hale. And then I had four books out. And then I stopped writing, but I never forgot that it was what defined me, if if you like. Yeah. Um, and so, probably ten years ago, eight years ago, I came back to it and decided uh, I'd I'd worked and I'd run a business and created a business, and but I defined myself as being a writer, and so I thought let's let's do it while I still have time to. Nice. Um, so, what was the reason uh, for stopping in the first place? Was it just sort of life? <laughs> Yeah, it was really life. Everybody asks that. Yeah. <laughs> um, lack of money. I, I, I got paid for all my books, uh, but it was two hundred pounds advance and, and negligible royalties. I, right. I was looking through old papers, and I did get some royalties, but not much. Fair. Enough. And then the fourth book, I had a German translation, which paid enough money to buy my now current wife an engagement ring. And so I got married, we had kids, I had to put food on the table. And so writing then as now, I suppose, was not very lucrative, um, although I've learned how to do it better now. Yeah. So when you moved into the, well, why yeah, why, why the change to historical mystery rather than carrying on with sci-fi? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I was younger, I read almost exclusively science fiction. I devoured it. Um, and it was quite a good time. So this was, well, I grew up through the 60s and 70s, uh, my teenage years and above. And science fiction was just sort of peaking then. You know, you had all mm. the big names of it. Um, and so I read that and read that. And, and so you tend to write what you read. Um, and then as I, I grew older and, and read just for pleasure rather than how to write, I discovered I started reading mysteries more and science fiction less. Um, I like to pretend that science fiction, once I'd stopped writing it, got much worse, but I think that's probably not right. <laughs> no, maybe not. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I was reading a lot of uh, mystery books, um, probably contemporary mysteries rather than historical, but I read, um, I don't know if you know C.J. Sansom, he writes the Shard Lake books. Uh, not personally. Uh, no, no, <laughs> neither do I. <laughs> and people like Connie Golden and so on. Um, and I read those and I, I had written uh, a contemporary police procedural in a sort of hybrid science fiction police uh, thriller. Um, 
And then we were just sitting at home one day in the evening and, and with the, the kids were here then. And I said, um, do you think anybody's ever written uh, an historical mystery uh, set in Moorish Spain in 1480 to 1492? And they looked at me and said, Eh? What? Probably not. And um, no. And it was one of those lightning bolt inspirations that comes. It, it was. It wasn't there, and then all of a sudden it was there, and it was there as a ten book series. And so that was the start of it. And I simply sat down. Well, I spent eighteen months researching the period and discovering that it wasn't a mistake to write something set there. Um, and and uh, really, I've carved a niche of my own. I'm the only person, as far as I know, that writes in that period, in that time, in that location, and from that point of view. So it's it's set in Islamic Spain, the last remnant of Islamic Spain. Okay. And so, I mean, obviously, it's been fairly lucrative. Uh, it's mm. obviously worked out all right. Um, so you used to be traditionally published, and now you're indie published. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. Would you ever switch back? I would say <laughs> yes and no. Yeah. Um, if I switched back, it would be for a particular pur- purpose. Um, so I, you you said, you know, when can we do this interview? And I said, not over the weekend. I'm, I'm going to the Harrogate Crime Festival. Yeah. Um, and I do two or three of those every year in different places, one in Bristol, one in Harrogate, and then whatever. Um, and I have a yen to sit on a panel there and, and just talk rubbish for... 20 minutes or half an hour um in harrogate you can't do that unless you have a traditional publishing deal because it's the publishers that put your name forward right uh and so i i have an idea for a modern police procedural book trilogy that is completely plotted from start to end and which i've written snippets of over several years and i thought i'm I'm very i'm very arrogant in that i think i would get a book deal but um i may be totally disabused (laughs) and i thought i would might try submitting that and then i will have the best of both worlds um the trouble is i've been talking over the weekend to lots of trad authors and, and there's and they're all going around saying, how much do you get as an Indian? I say, it's 70% of the sale price. And I say, ooh, ooh, my publisher says Amazon don't pay that much. And I said, they don't if you're a publisher. Um, and so these people are getting between 5 and 12% maximum. Yeah. Uh, and they're just, they're just saying, you know, I, I can't afford to give up my day job yet because I'm not earning enough money. And, and I think you'd have to give that up to go with a trad deal. And I'm not sure I'm willing to do that yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, question number two is how do you write? So are you do you sit down and plot out your books or do you just have an idea and then see where the story takes you? I am a plotter plus. Uh, I never used to be. Um, when, I, when I wrote in my 20s and as the science fiction, I used to sit down and see what came to me and write until I got enough words, basically. Uh, and then... When I started writing again, I thought, oh, I'll get my old books back. So I wrote to Hale and said, could I have the rights reverted? And they said, yeah, sure. (laughs) I'm not doing us any good. And so I got hold of them and read the books. And I thought, oh, my God, now I can see why they didn't sell. Because they are awful. And basically, they don't. They don't. uh, It's interesting. The right. I went through it and I thought the writing is actually pretty good. You know, I could write, Mm. um, but I couldn't tell a story. So I spent well, a long time looking at craft books. I never did it when I was younger. Uh, I'm not sure if they weren't there or if I just wasn't aware of them. And so I did, got a lot of craft books. And the one that opened my eyes really was one called Save the Cat by Blake Snyder, yeah. which is actually a, a screenwriting manual. But the theory is identical. And basically it says humans are hardwired for story. And if you don't tell them a story, then they will lose their interest. And he gives lots of examples of things that work and things that don't work. And I thought, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so I started to use his beat sheets and plot extensively. So that's what I do now. Um, And I started doing it as like really carefully. And then now I've discovered that I, I, I spend a month plotting and before I put a word on, on page, Nice. And what I've discovered is that if I, I I never stick to the plot, 
So I'm currently halfway through book eight in the series and it's gone off in all sorts of tangents. But unless I had my plot, I wouldn't have been able to get that far. Yeah. And so I've, I've kind of relaxed a little bit. I still, I still plot every single scene from beginning to end. So all my, my books are about 100,000 words. And so I will have 40 to 48 chapters, depending upon length. Right. And, and I, I, I simply start to write according to the plot. And then when I get to about a third of the way through or halfway through, lots of things start to happen. And as you refine your plot on the page, you discover things that come out of the woodwork and you have to accept them. And so that's what I've reached now. And I'm halfway through and it's easy from here on. It's like it's like rolling a boulder to the top of the hill. And once you get to the other side, it, it's really simple to get to the bottom. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, but I also write, um, and I, I write very fast. So, so I said I'm, I'm a plotter. I'm also a planner. So I have spreadsheets that tell me exactly what this book I'm writing now will be out on the 13th of February next year, and I know that. And I've already booked my editor, and I've already booked my cover designer, and I've already booked my proofreader. And so I know exactly when that's going to come. And my spreadsheet tells me. So, 30 days to plot, 60 days for first draft. Set it aside for a month come back to it, refine it, send it off to the editor, etc. And so I, I make, I drive people mad telling them what I do. And they, <laughs> they say, Oh, I couldn't do that. And I say, I couldn't not do it. Yeah. So, I mean, you say you write fast. How many words do you try to get done a day? Generally, I'm happy with 2000 plus. Um, but on a good day, I will. So 2000 plus means that in 60 days, I'll have done 120 K mm. and uh, there's, I have days off. And so I haven't written a word since last Wednesday. So I'm catching up now. Um, so 2000 plus words on a, my best day, I think I've done 12,000. Um, but I only write a couple of hours. So I write, I type very fast. So I write, I, I sit at the desk and I put on headphones and I play really loud rock music nice and i have a playlist on amazon music and it consists of things like neil young's electronic feedback music um and i know the songs so well now that i don't actually listen to them but the music turns off something in my head that and then the words just come so i just sit down and write for two hours um and that's probably more or less it and however many words i do in a couple of hours that's fine but I, I've discovered I'm better from two till four now. Okay. And I didn't realize that until recently. <laughs> okay. And so question number three is, are you a full-time author? If you are, how did you get there? And if you aren't, what steps are you taking to make it happen? Mm. Yeah, I am now. Uh, I have, well, I'm in a very fortunate position in that I'm now retired. Right. Um, and <laughs> I'm in receipt of my state pension and I'm in receipt of a very small work pension neither of which would allow us to enjoy the life that we have currently. So I earn, I currently earn from my writing as much as I earned when I owned and ran an IT company. Nice. And, and, but that hasn't always been the case. That's been about the last four years, I would imagine. When I started out, I earned as, as most other writers do, particularly indie writers, a pittance, you know, um, on a good day, I would sell a book. Yeah. And I was very pleased with that. Um, if that happened now, I'd be really upset that I don't know. Well, I can't remember the last time I just sold one book in a day, but it's, it's you know, I get upset if I sell less than three figures a day now. Um, so, and, and, but it is a, it is a process and it's a learning curve. Um, and and so my the, my revelation point came with realizing that you you might have written the best book you possibly have, and it it might be the best book in the world, but unless nobody knows about it, nobody is going to buy it. So um, I went and did did a course on Facebook advertising and marketing and all sorts of other things around it, but the main thing was the Facebook advertising, and I I threw a bit of money at it. Um, for three months and, and lost money, but not as much as I could have done. And then I took three months off and tried to refine what was wrong and then came back to it. And for some reason I struck lucky uh, and I tell everybody I, I struck lucky by having an orange advert. Uh -huh. um, 
I thought, that's weird. And then somebody fairly recently said to me, well, orange is the exact opposite on the color wheel from Facebook's blue. Yeah. And so it really stands out and smacks people between the eyes. Yeah, once you notice it in um, film posters, you can't unsee it. Yes. Yes, I know. I, know. I think it was Mark Dawson that said about the yellow and the orange. Yeah. And I thought, yes, that's a great idea. Yeah. So most of my, my ads now have orange in. And, and I, I just struck lucky in that first advert, which was really simple. It had a man on horseback in front of a castle, which happens to be Edinburgh Castle, which some nerd pointed out. And I thought, well, it doesn't matter. Nobody knows. <laughs> um, and so I, I, that, I, from that day on, I've never earned less than three times what i've spent on advertising that's healthy so it, it's good it is yeah yeah and i do other, i do amazon ads now and i've had a book bub which was like hanging on to the back of some flying beast and, and hoping you're never going to fall off because it, it just totally i, I think I, I got to number one in the us and number one in the uk wow. um only only for like 36 hours still counts but it was still pretty good <laughs> number one bestseller yeah plastered all over everything i never do that but i should do um and so it, it you know uh, uh, and that was giving away free books and the weird thing is is that i'm a big believer in free which which a lot of people say they would never do but i gave away forty-eight thousand free books in one day but still sold more of that title in that month than I have ever sold before or since. Right. And so, and so it, it's weird, you know, why would, you know, because people download it and look at it and say, hey, this is good. And they tell their mates and it's not free anymore. And so they have to buy it. Yeah. And I think it works like that. And, and, and it's getting, it's rising above the parapet and letting people see you. Yeah. And know who you are and what you write and whether they like it or not. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, th- those are obviously some successful things. Uh, t- question number four is, what mistakes do you think you've made? <laughs> yeah, this is, a, well, it's not a long list, but it's a fairly long yeah. list. Um, the first one, I think, is thinking that writing a good book is enough to be successful. So I, I mentioned this before in the previous answer, that you can write the best book you have, and unless some people can find you, it's not. And then the other thing I've discovered over doing this for a long time now is not trusting those whose job it is to create the the bits for you. So cover designers, trust them, formatters, all of the people that you use, your, your, in particular, your structural editor. I have a great structural editor who now tells me that if uh, I don't really need her anymore. And I say, yes, I do, because if I don't send it to you, then I will get away because I'm writing along and I say, oh, my God, what would Sarah say about that? And because I know I'm going to send it to her, I, I change it and fix it. Whereas if I didn't know I was sending it to Sarah, then I probably wouldn't fix mm. it and it would not be as good a book. Um, so build a, a trusted team around you and trust them to do their job. Um, uh, and, and one of the lessons I learned is I wanted to try and tell the story of my book on the f- cover, the first book. Right. And it was a it was a car crash. You know, I, I was very and I come across authors like this all the time. And they want they want a particular person on it and they want a particular scene on it. And that's no good. What you're selling is a feeling and you're selling the idea of this book is in a particular genre. So as soon as I went to a different designer and said, can you redo all of my covers, make them all the same and really hit the reader between the eyes and say, this is an historical mystery, then the the sales went up again. And so that's a good idea. Um, So that's that's the mistakes I've made, quite a lot of them. But um, oh, and not learning about story, thinking that I was good enough to just make I nearly said something else that started with S. Make stuff up (laughs) and uh, it would be good. And that's not the case. You need to know your craft and you need to practice your craft. Yeah. Cool. Well, question number five, the last one is, what's your final piece of advice for authors starting out in indie publishing? Yeah. Um, The first one is be professional. Um, And this applies to everything. My son's a musician. And when he was starting out, I said, turn up on time. Don't get drunk do your job and that that's he's built a whole career on that yeah. because in the music industry most people don't do that yeah <laughs> um 
and it's the same for writing you know um if you promise somebody you're going to do something do it preferably do it before you've told them they're going to get it and and put put enough into it to to make it as good as you can um so be professional is the first thing i'd tell them and and that is a huge that is a topic that we could talk for two hours about and i'm very um very keen on that people are professional i come across people all the time and you know they're not going to make it because they lack that mindset of professionalism yeah the other thing is to write um you know the malcolm gladwell ten thousand hour rule yeah that nobody can do anything unless they spent 10,000 hours learning how to do it or practicing it. So Hendrix apparently used to take his, his strat into the toilet with him and, and just played and played and played. He would, he would fall asleep with it on his lap. Um, so you need to write and you need to write lots and you need to, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad or indifferent, you need to write and then eventually you will get better at it. And so don't expect to start. <laughs> I come across people and they say, I met a guy who said, oh, I want to be a writer, but I need to earn 100K a year to make it worthwhile. How can I do that? And, and that, was a, that was his first mistake. And then somebody said, well, what have you written so far? Um, nothing yet, but it, I think it looks easy. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> great. Yeah. He, I don't think he made it. No. <laughs> Never seen him. Um, another thing is ask for and accept honest criticism. That's difficult to do but it's one of the biggest things that will improve you as a writer. Um, and then I've got define what your goals are and the reasons for writing. So um, I'm in a couple of Facebook groups and people, people say their main reason for writing is they thought it was a good idea to earn money and then they get really disillusioned. So do you want to earn money? Do you want to be famous? Do, is it for your satisfaction? Th those will define what you're going to write and how you're going to write. And, how much work you're going to put into it but everybody can everybody can do it if they want to do it but not everybody is going to like i said i'm really really fortunate the 99 percent of people will never make a living out of writing um, whether they're trad or indie and so you have to accept that that might be the case but writing for your own satisfaction is quite often will be enough yeah well, that's all great advice, and uh, that's your five questions. So thank you very much for coming on. It's been fantastic. Thank you for asking me, Tom. It's been a pleasure. That's it for this week's self-publishing spotlight. Don't forget that you can get your free self-publishing resource kit at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash starter kit. And if you want to appear as a guest on this show, send us brief details about yourself and your writing at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash spotlight dash guest. I'm Tom Ashford, and I'll see you again next week.